Amen. Amen. Man, it is good to be back. It is good to be back with y'all and have an opportunity to share with you uh, some of what God is doing in Cabrera in, in Athi River, where Emmett Holly and I had the privilege of partnering with the Bucket Ministry from September, uh, the early little bit there in September, and for nine or ten days. And so, as you saw uh, on the screens as you're following along, in Cabrera you have 408,000 people living in a little bit over three square miles. And for these 408,000 people, there are 78 latrines. 78 latrines, 78 opportunities uh, for them to use the, the bathroom in relative peace. And so what that looks like is open sewers and open drains headed towards uh, a river of sewage at the bottom of the hill. And so all their water lines crisscrossing open sewers all of their pathways to and from the marketplace, crisscrossing open sewers. Everywhere you walk in that little over three square miles, the smell of open sewers is, it's the smell that, that permeates the air. It's the smell that clings to your clothes. It's the smell that makes it into your lungs. But what you see is a phenomenal movement of God reaching the hearts of men and women in a profound way, in a way that really outpaces the ability of the local church to keep up with. And so I checked the numbers again right before I took the stage. And so last week in Cabrera, they saw 144 people come to faith. And in Athi River, where we work, they saw 43 people come to faith. Amen. And this is weekly. This isn't a high week. In fact, the week before in Cabrera, they saw 168 people come to faith, they made 1,500 home visits, 1,500 home visits. And, and so you're thinking kind of in those terms, you're like, well, this must be a mega church. This must be thousands of people engaged in this. This is about 102, 103, 20-something-year-olds doing daily visits, five to nine gospel conversations a day, 200,000 gospel conversations Thousands of men and women who now name the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior because of quiet faithfulness. People living in this area live on an average household income of $26 a month. And they have such an immense joy when they come to faith in Jesus that as we're there, you have this sense that just kind of wells up inside you that says, I am envious of their joy. Like, not their, not their contentment that they look at it and say, well, you know, we don't make much, and this is really hard, and this is really difficult, and this is a very dangerous area to live in. No, not their contentment. And how many of us, like, that's what our lives look like. If I just made a little bit more money, I'd be content. If I just had a little bit more free time, I, I'd be content. If I was just a little bit more healthy, I'd be content. So we jettisoned joy a long time ago. We're questing for contentment because we think joy is out of reach. What we saw on the faces of the men and women who come to faith in Jesus is a joy that transcends their hardship. It's a joy that is untouched by their difficulty, and it's a joy they give out over and over and over again. And y'all, we were privileged to see what God is doing there. We were privileged for this brief time to partner with them. And, and maybe some of what it looks like for us is that maybe some of the members from here decide, man, I want to partner with the Bucket Ministry and the work they're doing globally in the Amazon River Basin, in Africa, in, in Asia, and all over the world, all the various ways they're using the vehicle of clean and safe drinking water to invite men and women to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, the living water. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Listen, I want to thank you for your prayers. I want to thank you for your investment. I want to thank you for those of you who have already committed to partner with the Bucket Ministry, and, and you've been giving through their website, or you're giving through Severance. Uh, and you've been partnering and sending missionaries and doing so faithfully. Man, thank you so much for the ways you are partnering 
to extend the gospel and expand the reach of the kingdom of God here, near, and far. We're so thankful for your partnership, for the ways that God has equipped you and the ways you are faithfully serving in the extension of the gospel to people who so desperately need it. Uh, I'd love to pray for us. And then this morning, we're going to be journeying back through or heading back into our Chosen Exile series that Kenny and Brian took us to over the last couple of weeks. I'm so thankful for them. This morning, we're in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. You can begin to make your way there. If you aren't familiar with how to use the paper Bible, you can find a table of contents at the front of it. It's going to let you know where to locate 1 Peter. We're going to be in a few other books, so you can just kind of jot those down and find them a little bit later. But just know as we make our way through this morning, the large numbers are chapters and the small numbers are verses. And so let me read 4 through 6 for us. When you've got it, somebody, y'all got it? All right. For those of you who are still turning, you can do this. Turn, tap, flick your way there. Two, four through six. Peter writes, and he says, As you come to him, so as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Would you pray with me? God, we're so thankful for the work that that you are continuing to do even now in places like Kibera and places all over the world. So God, I just pray that you would be with uh, the various missionaries of the Bucket Ministry, uh, the men and women that you have called to faith in Jesus and you, you are sending out into some of the darkest, spiritually darkest regions of the world. Father, I just want to pray this morning, lead us in prayer for the devastation that has been experienced in both Morocco and in Libya. Some of the latest numbers that we've seen, 3,000 plus in Morocco died as a result of the earthquake, and and 11,000 died and 10,000 feared missing or dead in Libya as a result of the flooding. God, we pray for those who are engaged in relief work. We pray for those who are sharing the gospel. We pray for those who are just suffering and sorrowful, regardless of where they stand before you, that you would be a comforter to them. Father, I just pray that as we gather in this place, that our prayer for them would be joy and that our prayer for ourselves would be joy, that we would recognize what it is to want something different than what we've had. Not stuff, not possessions, not time, not health, but more of you in our lives. You lead us to praise you with all that we are, for all that you have made us to be, and all that you are making us to be. God, I just pray for our partner churches in this community. And we're so incredibly thankful for them, for the ways that you have equipped them to serve a unique people, for the salvations coming out, for the baptisms, for the life change. God, you are so good to be at work in so many places, accomplishing so much. And so God, I pray for our hearts this morning that you would transform them, that you would make them new. I pray for our spirits this morning that you would lead us in bold worship, even now in this time when we dedicate our energy, our concentration on you and on your word. God, I pray that we would be making much of you and glorifying you as we study, as we reflect, and as we worship you. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 So 1 Peter, let me just remind you that he's writing to a group of people who have found themselves living on the fringes of society, trying to understand their place in the world. They're trying to understand their their place in the midst of an empire that is not friendly, is not kind, is not accommodating for Christians. Kenny uh, read and really addressed the subject of what it looks like when we begin to crave the pure spiritual milk of the, world, of the word and we, we eschew, we, we push away malice, we push away sinfulness. And then uh, what we see in four through six is, 
is Peter begins to talk about what it looks like for God to make us into something. And he's going to really flesh this out a little bit later in the chapter, but he, but he builds us into something particular, and he does it on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He does it on the foundation of Jesus Christ, and so really the whole thing kind of sits on that and is established on that. So as he opens this up, he says, as you come to him, and the picture of this over and over and again is we have Jesus. He is this living stone, which is a little bit of a, of a conflict in terms. And so we're not familiar with stones that are alive. We're familiar with stones being that which is dead. But Jesus is this vibrant, living stone that he's the foundation that from him flows all life. And so like all of our energy or all of your lethargy as it might be right now. But listen, all of our energy, all of our excitement and all of our joy come from the fact that we are built on Christ. Amen. 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 Come on, y'all got to wake up. I know the donuts were late, but come on. <laughs> and so we are built on him. He is the foundation. And we see this picture in there, not of a once in time coming to him. So he doesn't say, as you have come to him, he says, as you are coming to him. So this is the picture. Jesus is there, and over and over again, we find ourselves coming, drawing near to him time and time again. So many of us, what we feel in our lives is that we are stumbling backwards. We are walking away from Jesus, this chosen and precious cornerstone. But in reality, what's happening? God, over the course of your life, Christian, is drawing you closer and closer and closer and closer to Jesus. And so what this gives us a picture of is being completely transformed and made new, renewed and established in the gospel of Jesus Christ through the vehicle of his spirit. And that realizes that presents itself as worship. It presents itself as worship. So it begins to kind of get us into this understanding and into this mind, uh, mind frame, this mindset that what does our worship look like, and if all of life is meant to be worship, then what does that say about how you apprise Jesus? What does it look like for you this week to draw near Jesus? What does your time in his word look like? What does your time in prayer look like? What is your time sharing the gospel? Let's just go ahead and pretend that we're all sharing the gospel. And if that's true, you what does that look like? Are you doing it out of a sense of obligation? Or are you doing it out of a sense of I delight in telling people about Jesus because he has so completely transformed my life. He's so changed who I am. He's so changed what I do that I just can't shut up about him. This is the picture of what it looks like for a group of people repeatedly to draw near to him. Amen? Amen. This is what he's made us to be. So he says, listen, as you come to him, he is a living stone. He's a living stone. And what has happened to this living stone? He says, he has been rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. He's been rejected by men. And so we have this sense of, of course, we remember the crucifixion of Jesus. We remember what it was like for him to be betrayed by Judas, to be turned over to the, to the chief priest, to be crucified by the people he came to save. And so in some sense, that's a picture of what it looks like to be rejected by men. But we recognize in this that, that this rejection has ongoing consequence for them because they have decidedly rejected Jesus, because they've decidedly said, he is not the king of kings, he is not the Lord of lords, he is not the son of God, he is not the savior of man. That has put them positionally at odds with God. But notice it's done nothing to diminish his sovereignty. It's done nothing to diminish his worth. What does he say? He's in, in the sight of God. Everybody say chosen and precious. Y'all, he is chosen and precious. The apostle Peter, in speaking before the council in Acts chapter four, he's responding to their frustration that he was a part of healing a blind beggar. Like they see Peter out there and Peter in Acts chapter three is a part of seeing this blind beggar healed and they are so incredibly frustrated because people saw the power of God at work in Peter and they turned to believe and follow Jesus. And so they're like, listen, you've got to come answer before us because these people are way too happy. They're way too into following God now. 
and we're going to throw the book at you. And it's a big book. Amen. I don't feel like y'all have laughed very much lately. Like, have you forgotten how? And so he's in the middle of this. Look at this, Acts 4, 11 and 12. Peter's describing this in verse, let me go back to verse eight. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by the way, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. Peter essentially says, we didn't do anything. Jesus accomplished this. Jesus accomplished this. And he says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. This Jesus, he was rejected by you. You consider yourselves the builders of the temple. You consider yourself the bedrock. You consider yourselves the foundation. But this Jesus, the one who healed this man, was completely rejected by you, and he has become the cornerstone. And then he goes on, and there is therefore no salvation in anyone else. For there is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What Peter writes here echoes what he said earlier there. Jesus had been rejected. He had been cast off, but as God looks at him in the economy of God, he is chosen and precious. And even as we sit here today, and even as we relate to this truth today, there is no name under heaven by which you might be saved. If you want to be saved, if you want to be uh, set free from your sins, if you want to be forgiven, there is no good you can do. There's no name by which you can call other than trusting on the name of Jesus, the chosen and precious cornerstone. So he was once and for all rejected by them, but still we find in too many of our hearts and in too many of the hearts of our family members, he persists in being rejected. And this is where some of us are today. There's a part of us that wants to receive the good news of the gospel, but not in so much as it calls us to sacrifice, not in so much as it causes us to dethrone ourselves and to enshrine Jesus. So we've kind of taken this acceptance rejection model. Jesus, I want the life saving, I don't want the life transforming. I, I, I take from you salvation, I hold on to my sexuality. I take from you salvation, I hold on to my gluttony. I take from you salvation, but I, but I hold on to my riches. I take from you salvation, but I hold on to whatever it feels like would be the most significant sacrifice for you to let go of. It's your family, it's your free time, it's your money, it's your sexuality, it's your car, it's what you thought retirement would be for you. You're willing to receive goodness from God, but aren't willing to give him anything. And the truth of that is, you live in a glorified rejection of Jesus. And what does God delight for you to do? To let go of that which holds on to your soul and to, hold, and to run to Jesus because he stands with arms open, with heart extended, with grace and mercy to cover your transgressions in your past, present, and future, and he calls you to become a worshiper of the one true king. And he's worth it. He is worth it in the good times and the bad. He is worth it because he and he alone is the one by whom we are changed and made new and forgiven, amen? So y'all, what is he doing for us or to us, rather? So we've come to him, we're coming to him. He's been rejected by some. God says he's chosen and precious. And he looks, Peter looks at the church and he says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. He says, you yourselves like living stones are being built up to a spiritual house. Paul writing of this same kind of phenomenon in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, he asked this question. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So we are being built into something. Jesus is the cornerstone, so he's laid there and we are being built upon him and we are being made in this into a spiritual house. 
<laughs> this is a radical concept. As we sit here in the middle of this worship center and, and we look at, uh, at the walls and we look at the construction and you walk across the parking lot, we have some concept of what it is like to see something built. And certainly we have a concept of what it looks like to pay for the something that was built. But what he's talking about within this is what it looks like for you and I to be built together. We are being made into a spiritual house for an express purpose. What is that purpose? He says it is to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, even as we hear this, we begin to reflect and you begin to ask the questions of what does it look like for me to be a spiritual house? And what does it look like for me to offer a spiritual sacrifice? And what does it look like for me to be a priest? That's the wrong question. Notice he doesn't say there, I've made you individual in to be a priest. What does he say? I've made you into a priesthood. But this is radically different. This is radically different. What Peter says here is so incredibly helpful for our 21st century individualistic perspectives. Let's just call it this. Let's just say our selfishness. My sense of individual autonomy. I'm not willing to relent anything if it means you getting what you want. It's certainly at the sacrifice of me getting what I want. Quit looking at me like that. Now you're guilting me. Fine. Have what you want, but I'm going to have what I want too. Oh my goodness. It's my first Sunday back and he's already arguing with me with his eyes. <laughs> Peter writes here and says we're being built into a spiritual house. Being made into a holy priesthood together. Amen. So what that looks like is, is me joining with the Williams. What that looks like is me joining with the Fours. What that looks like is me joining with the Nichols. What that looks like is me joining with Terry. Mm, maybe not. What that looks like is me. <laughs> what that looks like is all of us being joined together. And we can't do this apart. Y'all, that is the beautiful thing that our God has constructed. That's the beautiful thing, and in my mind, mind-blowing and somewhat ridiculous thing. Like, did he have any understanding of what the 21st century church would look like? Did he have a window into 2020 and all the ways we try and tear ourselves apart? Did he not see what it looks like for people to put signs in front of their house that say, I'm voting for this person or I'm voting for that person, which is tantamount of saying, don't have a conversation with me about anybody else. When we worked in Kibera, one of the phenomenal things that's happening there is there are about 35 tribes represented in that 408,000 people. Wow. And 30 of those tribes are on the team of missionaries that are sent out. Mm. My friend Chris talks about repeatedly, they'll have people come from all over Africa and they'll say, you don't understand what's happening here. Like, we don't work together. It's impossible. And there's a sense in which I hear that, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And there's a sense in which I hear that and think, I'm so broken from my own context. We don't have 35 tribes. We have 35 genders, but we don't have 35 tribes. <laughs> we have all these various ways of splitting ourselves. We split ourselves according to where we live. We split ourselves according to socioeconomics. We split ourselves according to background. We split ourselves according to politics. We split ourselves according to our views on the end times. We split ourselves on all kinds of non-ethical decisions. And we move past even the question of what it looks like for us to work with each other. And when we do that, we reject the plan and the purpose of God. He is making us into a spiritual house to offer acceptable sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. There have to be better ways for us to establish in our hearts that moving forward in disunity is unacceptable. Because moving forward in disunity, moving forward in separation, moving forward in spiritual segregation, moving forward in thinking that we are all there is, uh, irrespective of what God is doing in the other churches of our community, that we and we alone are the standard bearers for orthodoxy, that is nuts. That's pure insanity. 
And it does damage to the body of God, seeing that the body of God is only one group of people gathered at 1100 Ring Road. Are you kidding me? Like we are privileged to worship the same king. We are privileged to work alongside the same people, brothers and sisters, and we are privileged to have the same opportunity to offer spiritual sacrifices shoulder to shoulder with them. Amen? Amen. When you begin to look at your life and you begin to think like, what do I have to offer and and what would God want from me? And some of us look at our lives and some of us look at it's just this, this, this laundry list of all the various ways you feel like you've been a disappointment to God. And so you feel like God would want nothing from you. He doesn't want anything from your life. He doesn't want anything that you have to offer. You look at it as if you're this kid in, in preschool who's just kind of coloring all of the paper and you've never met a line you didn't want to cross. And, and it's just kind of there and it's crayon. So we all know that crayon isn't great. Color pencils are where it's at. And so and it's just kind of there and, and you just hand it over to God. And, and you have this assumption that as God looks at your drawing, he would say, this is ridiculous. This is unacceptable. But what does the text tell us? on the basis of what are our offerings made acceptable to God? What has he said plainly? He says, made acceptable through Jesus Christ. I mean, that's such a relief. That's such an encouragement. I look at my life, I look at the mistakes that I have made, I look at the mistakes I am making and and project forward and and likely the mistakes I'll make in the future and have no confidence. Thinking that there's anything that Matt can do that God would look at and say, oh wow, that is amazing. Oh my goodness, like that's really awesome. Thanks so much for that, buddy. You're awesome, fella. But it is made glorious and wonderful. Through the blood of Jesus. And you scrapping together and doing whatever you can and offering whatever you can. And and I'm reminded of the widow's might who gave all that she had and it wasn't very much and everybody looked down upon it. All of our gifts are made acceptable through Christ Jesus. And God, I'm trying. And God has has given you the, the wherewithal, the ability to be empowered by his Holy Spirit, that we might delight in giving him more and more and more. And it is in the divesting of ourselves, the giving away of ourselves, that we get more of Jesus. And some of what it looks like for us to be built up into the spiritual house is recognizing that, oh man, my brother or sister, they need my help. Like they need my assistance. And so I'm over there and I'm working and I'm invested and I'm involved in their life and I'm doing this and I'm building them up and they're getting stronger and they're getting more healthy. So now they're able to offer a greater sacrifice to the Lord, amen? Amen. And then we look around and they're like, oh my goodness, what about this person over here? I'm like, ah, I completely forgot about them. I don't know them, I'm so self-obsessed. Let's go over and work with them. And so we're working with them and we're building them up. And and then all three of us or all four of us together are able to offer a better sacrifice to the Lord, Amen? amen? I feel like you're not getting it. I feel like you're not getting it. David, would you come up here? Come on. Howard, would you come up here? Yeah, come on. It's show and tell time. Would you mind coming up here? Check this out. This may be a horrible illustration. We're going to find out real quick. Y'all coming up on the stage. Everybody say, welcome. All right, so watch this. If you'll just kind of stand over there. Dave, if you're just gonna stand over there, Howard, you stand over here. So, like, I'm in the middle of offering a spiritual sacrifice to the Lord, right? And I've got a good sweat going. That's how we know I'm trying hard. (laughs) And, like, I'm engaged in this, and we're just trying hard, and we're doing this, and then God lays somebody on our mind. And he says, oh, my goodness. If you guys work together, you could, as the body of Christ, as this spiritual house, you could give an offering to the Lord that would be acceptable through Jesus Christ. I'm like, I've got to go over here. And so then David and I, are, oh, we're working together and, and, and we're getting it done and, and we're working hard. And then David says, you know, Howard's not as bad as you think he is. <laughs> I'm just like, really? And David's like, yes, he's so good. He's so amazing. He's so encouraging to you. What, can't you hear him? And I'm just like, sometimes, but I hear Mary and she's really the encouraging one, right? 
And so David's like, look, let's go get Howard. And so we're working over here together, and we're like, come on, come on, don't be resistant. <laughs> and so the three of us are working together, and we're building this spiritual house. And then our sister over there, she sees us, and she's like, why haven't you called me? And she's so bright and so wise, and so she comes on over here, come on. And so she comes on over here, and now the four of us, we're, we're working together, and do you know any four-part harmonies? Da, 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 da. There you go. And so like we're singing in harmony and our lives are caught up in this overwhelming ability to serve the Lord and to satisfy him and to offer sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And we're showing this microcosm of what the body looks like. And then everybody in here is like, oh, am I not on stage? And David didn't want you here, but that's the real reason. But he's working through that. And so then we begin to get more and more people and we're working together and we're collaborating together and making a bigger difference in E-Town and our community and beyond and we're living on mission and all of this because we've sought to make much of Jesus and less of us. Amen. Amen. Much of Jesus and less of us. We're building our lives on the precious cornerstone of Jesus and he's making us into this spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifices to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, would you give them a round of applause? <laughs> so we're being built into something, and then Peter goes and he founds it in Isaiah 28, 16, and he quotes, Behold, I'm laying in Zion. I'm laying in Jerusalem a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The way that God sets things up, there is, in some sense, the expectation that when we serve Jesus, we are going to suffer. We're going to suffer. Life's going to be hard. It's going to be disappointing. It, serving Jesus and giving your life to him does not give you an out for suffering. It reframes our suffering. It reframes our lives. But it does not mean that we go untouched by suffering. In fact, Jesus talking to the disciples said, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. A servant's not above their master. And so there's some, there should be in some sense an expectation of suffering coming our way when we commit our lives to serve King Jesus. But what we read here is this promise that a life spent serving God in Jesus by the power of his spirit will never be a disappointment. And Christian, we are those who live with an eternal perspective. Not a five, not a 10, not a 15, not a 50-year perspective, but an eternal perspective. And eternally, the good news is, when you stand before God, you will not have reason to be ashamed. Amen. He will not have reason to be disappointed because you have built your life and we have built this church and this ministry on the chosen precious cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, in a moment, we're going to join our voices to sing. One of the ways that we offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord, as we read in Hebrews 13, 15, is through song. Listen to what the author of Hebrews writes. It says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. One of the lines we're gonna read in this song or singing this song is as long as I'm breathing, I will offer praise to him. What a wonderful picture of what it looks like for us to sing praise, to offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. So in these next moments, man, can I just ask you to lift your voice, to shout as loud as you can, to rend your heart before God, that we together would be joined in one song with one voice as we lift high the name of Jesus.